Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to apply to be a guest on the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, so today I have Dr. John Cotter on the line, and he is chairman and founder of Cotter International. John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Adam. It's a pleasure. All right, John. So you're you're an you're an entrepreneur. You're an academic. Uh, many people would call you a guru. Um, I'm excited to get into uh, your entrepreneurial uh, ventures and also just your history, what you've done. I mean, you have an accomplished career. Um, over 22 books, two fables written. Um, I know you have a book that we'll be talking about quite extensively today. That's just released, which is called uh, Change. How Organizations Achieve Hard-to-Imagine Results in Uncertain and Volatile Times. So um, very, very on point, and I should say uh, on theme and target for, for what's going on in the world right now. We have some volatile times. Um, for context, for everybody that was watching this, we're recording this in uh, March of 2022. So, John, uh, let's see. Just to get us started, we'll start this episode the way that we start them all with our Mission Matters Minute. So, John, we at Mission Matters, we amplify stories for entrepreneurs, executives, and experts. That's our mission. John, what mission matters to you? I am trying to do everything I can that's possible to help more organizations adapt with speed and intelligence and agility to this increasingly changing, volatile uncertain world we're living in. If there's uh, anything that's clear from the many research projects I've done over the last few decades, it's that that rate of change has been going up Mm -hmm. and institutions everywhere, public and private, uh, are struggling with that as are individuals. Mm -hmm. And when you get it right, the possibilities these days in terms of the opportunities uh, to make a impact on life on earth are unprecedentedly large. And when you get it wrong, it can be uh, catastrophic. So I care a great deal about helping organizations through my firm, through my writing, through conversations like this become more uh, adaptive and agile and faster moving because the payoff to the 7 billion of us who live on this planet can be uh, significant. There's no question about this. And there's no question also that as you will know, Adam, Mm -hmm. there are a lot of uh, people among those 7 billion in rich and poor countries Mm -hmm. that don't have a quality of life uh, that Uh, we want them to have and that they want themselves to have. And organizations performing well in this swirly environment can make a huge difference uh, to people's lives. And that excites me. It has excited me for um, decades now. And as the world moves faster and faster, it continues to excite me more. Oh, it, it is so exciting just to think about what's possible, like what's already taken place, but then what's possible going forward. Um, so I, I, I will talk about Cotter International. I want to talk about maybe some of the specific work you're doing there, too. But I think just to get us started, like I do want to take you back maybe some of those decades for a bit, if I may. Um, like when did this I don't know if I would use the word obsession, fascination, like when did this calling, whatever words you would use to help organizations and to kind of go down this route? Like, was it a moment in time, a progression? Like, like when did this become your thing? Well, most obviously it became consciously uh, in my mind on a regular basis as a result of my doctoral thesis uh, at Harvard. Uh, quite a long time ago, in which I, I told you I was going to take you back, John. It's okay. <laughs> I want to hear the beginning. I want the story. <laughs> well, here I was, maybe 22 or 23 years old. Yeah, that's what I want. <laughs> and I chose to study uh, with the extended work 20 different cities and their mayors during the uh, late 1960s. The late 1960s being a 
an unusually volatile time with a lot going on with uh, the war and peace movements and social justice, et cetera. And what I learned from that study is that, first of all, the difference between the three mayors that all of our judges said did the best and their cities did the best, they performed the best, and the three that did the worst, the difference between the best and the worst was far greater than I would have ever dreamed. Wow. Okay. If you could have taken the worst and moved them up just to the middle, it would have had a huge impact on millions and millions and millions of people and their lives. Number one. And number two, the three mayors who were judged to do the best uh, were three very different personalities one of which was a, uh, one of the founders of Texas Instruments, which was an early high-tech company, uh, one of the first consumer products from tech ever, a calculator, Texas Instruments. Oh, I remember them, my algebra class. I was there. <laughs> well, he was president for a while and then became uh, um, the mayor of Dallas for two terms. Our three best mayors, what they were able to do less through managing the bureaucracy than providing leadership to the city was to, while others mayors were just trying to survive the tumultuous 1960s, these guys were looking for opportunities to do something to uh, not just survive, but to make their cities uh, truly thrive. Mm -hmm. And they did so using some classic leadership stuff. I now realize I didn't realize that when I was 23 years old. And I was inspired by them, uh, by the businessman, by the uh, kind of uh, traditional Irish politician mm -hmm. uh, in another city and a small family businessman. Um, in Atlanta, where, among other things, uh, when I was uh, interviewing people, I got to meet and spend, gosh, an hour and a half at age 23 in the first row of the Ebenezer Baptist Church with Martin Luther King Sr. Wow. About the city, what that mayor had done, and of course about his son. So wow. I walked away from that experience just pumped. Yeah. And wondering what could be done. Well, first of all, was this just an oddity of uh, urban governance or was it applicable more broadly than that? The answer is it's applicable everywhere. And two, could some things actually be done to improve the performance of institutions uh, in a uh, faster moving world? And the answer to that is there's a lot that can be done. And mm. it's very exciting. Anyway, it goes back to me at age 23, probably absorbing about 10% of what I was being told. Uh, but even that 10% was. Uh, um, it's life changing. Life changing. Yes. 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 And so uh, so now you, of course, go you, you decide to kind of continue along this path and you and you take I believe you start the academic route. So tell me a little bit more about that and your career there. Yes, so I become an assistant associate of full, uh, a chaired uh, professor at Harvard Business School, um, uh, which I loved. I loved it. I loved my colleagues. And I consulted a day a week on the mm -hmm. side. Uh, why anybody would have hired me at age 25 as a consultant, I admit I'm not quite sure, <laughs> but they did. And I can still remember some small businessmen, small their companies are doing like 50 million or something like this. Uh, being old enough to be my father or grandfather, actually wanting to know my opinion, uh, which gave me, uh, made me want to try harder to make sure my opinion was going to be useful mm -hmm. to them. Um, but at Harvard, we did at least a dozen, if not 15, multi-year research projects involving hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of organizations, mostly businesses, but also nonprofits, universities, uh, and governments. And we learned more and more, both about 
the challenges associated with the, the kind of context that has emerged here in the 21st century and what can be done in that context that really uh, adds just almost unbelievable value uh, to the broader community uh, and to, as I said earlier, life on earth. Hmm. Um, and 22 books. Uh, and then a, a decade ago, uh, 12 years ago, decided I wanted to try to open up another vehicle for uh, helping organizations beyond writing books, beyond teaching at Harvard, beyond doing communication, things like this. And that was actually creating a management consulting firm, which we did. Yeah. Uh, that got named after me, Cotter International. And that has been a fascinating experience. We're, it actually does research. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they now, it's not me anymore. It's mm -hmm. expanded to, a, 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 I think there are 42 pictures on our <laughs> website of people. It's amazing how that happens, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, incredible. Uh, Where'd all these people come from? I had that moment. <laughs> Right, 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 right. I know that doesn't sound right. That might not be the politically correct way to say it, but I've had that moment. I'm like, wait a minute. No, I understand completely. Also, uh, uh, what am I doing to make sure that they get paid? Absolutely. You know, and that their families are taken care of. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, but what they have been able to do over the last uh, decade to extend beyond any beyond what I could have guessed when we started the firm mm -hmm. of helping uh, companies do what I couldn't do as a single individual is mm -hmm. totally um, amazing. Uh, so, so when I look at your career and when I look at, you know, the amount of people and just the experiences, and now that I have the story about where this all started, really interesting. Um, but when I look at all this, like what excites you about working with entrepreneurs? Like to be in to be in the game, work with entrepreneurs this long to wake up to be excited about it. Like, what gets you going on that? Like, what's part of that part that's just that thing where you're like, man, love doing this. Well, I think building something mm -hmm. that uh, can do more than I can do by myself, mm -hmm. and uh, could be around for any number of years, having an impact, even though I'm not involved. Um, is very exciting. And I love working for entrepreneurs as clients of our firm. I can remember, I can remember uh, a couple of times at Harvard where the Young uh, Presidents Organization, which is almost all uh, entrepreneurs or small businessmen, yep. um, asked me to speak. And after the first one, I remember uh, commenting, coming home and my wife, Nancy, asked me, how did the day go? And I said, it was really fun. And she said, why? And I said, well, that's a good question. <laughs> and it was that group of people. There's something about people who want to uh, create jobs, create innovative mm -hmm. products and services, um, build something uh, that uh, those kinds of people um, I find uh, just uh, exciting to be around and to talk to and to try to help. So, uh, and then it's been that way for at least a couple of decades. Amazing. Um, so on our platform, of course, mission matters. I mean, mission is really a central theme that you, that kind of we weave through all of our interviews and, and the platform, I mean, thousands of interviews, thousands of people, of course, that I asked the question in the beginning, you know, what mission matters to you, but asking the, asking the um, question, maybe a little bit more broadly, um, like what is mission met maybe in your overall career? Like how is that kind of woven itself through your career? I know that's a big question. I mean, you have an expanded career, but like what is mission meant? Like if you look at the body of work. But I think I have been, may not have said it had you interviewed the 25 year old version of me. Yeah. I think I have been since my early twenties, a very mission oriented person. And that is to say that the work that I've done mm -hmm. is, um, 
emotionally compelling to me. And I think it has real purpose for me. And hence, it makes my work not seem like work. People mm -hmm. often, for decades, have said, uh, what is your work? And I say, well, I don't work. <laughs> you know, I no, no, I can remember. Um, <laughs> Um, that threw them off. That throws them off. Oh, you're clearly, clearly. You're clearly. Like, what? <laughs> the, the time I met Spencer Johnson, who wrote, uh, among other things, Who Moved My Cheese, mm -hmm. uh, and sold a zillion copies with it. Yes, he did. He impacted a lot of lives. I had I bought at least three copies. <laughs> okay, there you go. I met him in Chicago. He came to see me give a speech. And we ended up walking up and down Lake Michigan. And um, he asked me, what kind of work do you do at Harvard? And I remember saying to him, I don't work at Harvard. And he looked at me <laughs> and said, you, you don't? Are you, are you at MIT? And I said, no, <laughs> I, I've got a few degrees from MIT, but I, don't, I have fun at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And I remember him just stopping. We're walking, right? And he goes, I like that. Mm -hmm. I like that. Uh, and I said, would you like to come and have fun with us? And I actually got him a part-time appointment for a couple of years um, in which he helped us generate uh, uh, kind of innovative and new ways to think and to communicate ideas mm -hmm. with his deep understanding of telling stories. That's great. And and I guess taking this question from another angle, because, you know, on my end, I, I get to ask this question and I get to um, delve into mission and the thought process of mission for with our with the entrepreneurs that I interview. So, you know, that's quite a few, but it's it's more of a limited engagement. Right. Where I, we do. Some, we, we have some obviously some of these people, uh, some of these individuals I've built a relationship with afterwards. But for yourself, but I'm not necessarily working on their business or consulting or things like that, nor am I um, an academic on that end. So I'd be interested to kind of hear your thought process on how you've seen maybe and not like a specific entrepreneur or anything like that, but the theme of mission, like how you've seen that maybe weave into or even work um, through the lives of maybe some of the entrepreneurs you've either consulted with or that have come through your doors um, at Harvard or otherwise, like what is mission is if there is, by the way, there may not be um, if there is some type of common theme or thing that you see yep. that often comes up. Where it all comes together is the most impactful and successful entrepreneurs that I have had a, the opportunity to get to know over the decades. Uh, we're also pretty darn remarkable <laughs> at leadership. They are, aren't they? Not just management. <laughs> As a matter of fact, some of them were not very good managers. Yeah. But they were smart enough to, to A, know that, and to B, <laughs> to make sure that their number two or number three person in the firm was <laughs> a superb manager and could work as a, a team. And once you go that leadership uh, route as opposed to the management route, that's where you bump into words like mission mm -hmm. and purpose and vision. Because the more that I've studied uh, great leaders historically over the mm -hmm. centuries, all of the ones that uh, from the best information we have today did something that really mattered and uh, that uh, improved the quality of a country or a company, mm -hmm. did so by providing leadership, which included mm -hmm. a deep sense of purpose, mm -hmm. a real sense of mission, and a capacity to communicate that in a way that would mobilize other people, energize other people, mm -hmm. and make extraordinary things happen. So. Leaders both build organizations in the first place, i.e. entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. but they also take existing mature organizations and change them in ways that take advantage of the opportunities that are coming around their context and avoid the threats. And as those opportunities and threats have grown 
over mm. the past five decades of my career in this rapidly changing world, leadership has become a more important element of what makes a successful CEO. Mm -hmm. And the whole term mission and vision and purpose have become more important uh, discussion points in understanding them and in trying to be them uh, and to uh, run a great enterprise today. Mm. So I would say mission has always mattered, but it matters more today because leadership matters more in the kind of context we're operating. So taking like, if you were talking to that, um, you know, to that 20 some year old, you know, going back and you were to give him maybe a couple of uh, tips or words of advice on his journey, um, what kind of things would you tell him? I would tell him, listen to himself. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, your instincts are pretty good. They've gotten you from a very middle-class existence mm -hmm. uh, into uh, two degrees, technical degrees from MIT and one from Harvard. Uh, they've gotten you a great job with a great uh, group of colleagues here at uh, Harvard. Therefore, don't get caught up in the political noise that's a part of all organizations. Mm -hmm. with the you have to do this and you shouldn't do that and you need just figure out what you can do that will add value to your employer in my case Harvard Business School mm -hmm. and that excites you deeply and go with it and if that is uh, nobody else is doing that don't worry about it it's going to work itself out so have more self-confidence in your own gut instinct and go with it uh, not because uh, that's necessarily always the best advice, but there's enough data from your first 23 or 24 years on earth that uh, it is good advice for you. That's mm -hmm. what I tell myself. Fantastic. All right. So uh, great answer. I I'm inspired. I'm fired up. What are we doing, John? <laughs> <laughs> so so now I get to say at the end of the day, what'd you do today? I had fun too. Why I got to talk to John and we went through now what now what I would tell that 22 year old Adam. I'm like, I don't know. But uh, back to back to um, to yourself. And also, I want to switch gears here a bit. And I want to uh, I do want to spend some time on the book. So the name of the book is called Change. Um, I guess just to start out on the book side of things, like what is 22 books? Um, you've written quite a bit. I mean, why this book? Why now? Right. This book came out of a project that started five years ago at the consulting firm at Cotter International. A bunch of us in our whiteboard room in our Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts office, kicking around some ideas about what we were learning from brain science about human nature and why that was important uh, to running and leading organizations. And that led to a study group within the firm uh, that both did research on our own clients mm -hmm. and um, more uh, thinking through what the uh, brain science people were saying about human nature and what we concluded most fundamentally is that we had come to the point now where we knew enough that you could start to talk about an emerging science of change, not just my opinion, your opinion, somebody else's opinion, mm -hmm. that there's actually a science here that's rooted in uh, human nature and organizational nature, if you will. And that uh, if you understood that science, you could see why people struggle with change and why sometimes they thrive and accomplish things that are hard to believe. And then the book breaks that down into all of the major ways that firms today go about trying to adapt from uh, developing a new strategy and executing it to restructuring, to digital transformation, to M&A and M&A integration, to cultural change, to 
uh, well, adopting some form of uh, scaled agile as a way of running the business mm -hmm. and uh, tell stories from our uh, own client list of uh, how this can be done in a way that just so far exceeds the norm today, um, as well as some failure stories that we got from the press and from my prior research. So mm -hmm. you've got uh, pairs all the way through. Um, and it's very practical, it's very hands-on, and no matter whether you're dealing with a strategy issue, a digital issue, an M&A issue, a cultural issue, anything that involves change, it, it gives you a framework and the science behind the framework of how you can make it happen better, faster, smarter, mm -hmm. and to everybody's advantage. Um, now I know that uh, I know that for anybody watching this, like sometimes when you're going, especially if you've written a book, sometimes when you go down the path of writing a book, you're at that initial whiteboard, like where you start and where you think you're going to end, or sometimes going to be completely different areas and you know new new things that you discover during the book writing process, or, or during in your case the data, right, accumulating the data. Um, was there a, a surprise or like a curveball or just something that came out of when you got to this end of the, of the project where you're like, it could be an outcome, it could be anything. Was there something that was like, oh, wow, I didn't expect that like that. Wow. Just like just like in the beginning, like taking you back to that early 20s, John, um, when you got when you got the data of the three mayors and you're like, wow, I, I wasn't expecting that big of a difference. Was there anything that just surprised you at the end of this book writing process? Well, one thing that clarified, and it was a surprise, and that uh, also um, influenced the structure of the book and how we wrote about everything, um, which we could not have articulated at the beginning of the process, was uh, the what and the how of change. Hmm. People focus on the what to the detriment of the how. That is to say, they focus on my problem is strategy. My problem is digital. My problem is culture. Mm -hmm. Not uh, my problem is uh, change. My problem is people. I just had a guy, a CEO of a, what does he run? Two billion, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, talked to me three weeks ago and he said, before we started working with you, I would have told you that our digital initiatives, uh, the challenge there was 70% technical and 30% people. Hmm. He said, I've worked with you for a year now. And one of the things we've learned is I had it backwards. Hmm. It's 70% people, 30% technical. Wow. And, and once you get that insight, it takes you to a second insight, which is the fundamental problems you run into these days with strategy execution, with M&A, with cultural change, with restructuring, with anything that involves change. People put those in different buckets. You know, this is a strategy issue. This is a digital issue. This is a cultural issue. And they treat them separately, not recognizing that the fundamental challenge they have in each of their cases is on the how side, which is how you make change happen, which relates to people and everything we write about in, these, in, in that book. Um, very often I've discovered that I can introduce two CEOs, one of whom is conceptualizing that his big challenge is executing strategy and the other which is conceptualizing his problem is completely differently. Mm -hmm. it's, a, uh, um, it's a restructuring issue, it's a cultural issue. Mm -hmm. And yet, if one of them has done a good job, he has or she has a great deal to teach the other because mm -hmm. it's the same fundamental problem they're dealing with which is making change happen faster, smarter, uh, more agilely to uh, take advantage of the opportunities and duck the threats around us today. 
this is one of my favorite parts about about books and writing books is the process like you never like that end when you're done with it and you understand that you you got something new or clarified as you as you, to use your words um you got clarification on a particular on a particular topic like it's amazing to me that's the that's the beauty of creating something new and of even going through that that um difficult process of, of getting another a book together um what is uh so when a reader picks up this book, obviously they're going to go through, you know, maybe stories, case studies, things like that. What are some of the, some of the tools or takeaways that you hope somebody kind of walks away with? I know that'd be different for every person, but what are some things that oh, you walk sure. away with? No, there are dozens and dozens of uh, takeaways, but I think the biggest one um, that becomes clear as you read enough of these stories mm -hmm. is the most fundamental driver of creating organizations that can adapt uh, faster, smarter mm -hmm. to this volatile, uh, changing world is more leadership from more people. Mm -hmm. The typical CEO and exec that I deal with even today thinks of leadership in very narrow terms, a small number of people that sit on top of a hierarchy. And indeed, it's hard to find a business these days of any size in which uh, if you're not getting pretty darn good leadership from mm -hmm. a small number of people at the top of a hierarchy that they can be doing well. But the key to actually producing the change smart enough, fast enough, et cetera, is getting is is tapping into a much broader base of people and allowing them in a aligned way to provide initiative, proactive, um, and to lead. More leadership from more people. It's important in business. It's increasingly important in government. It's important everywhere. So switching focus um, slightly, I know you've mentioned some of the things and maybe some of the types of companies you've worked with at Cotter International, but I want to go a little bit deeper. So tell us exactly what, what um, Cotter International offers. Well, we help guide, educate, inspire our clients uh, to learn how to get more people providing the kind of leadership that can drive uh, adaptive uh, behavior on the part of the firm, uh, whether it's in executing strategies or putting in new digital tools or changing culture or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, teams of four or five people typically working for uh, six months, two, three years. I just got an uh, email um, mm -hmm. what well, last week from the uh, former CEO. He's just retired of one of our clients. And he and one of his colleagues have written a book about yeah. their adventure uh, in which uh, apparently we play a prominent uh, role. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a beautiful case. Mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, when we met them, they had a strategy process in place mm -hmm. in which they would identified lots of opportunities. But they had been going for years, three or four years, in which they were making very little progress, mm. at being able to turn that into revenue growth, to turn that into better products and services, to turn that into stock price growth. And working with our team, they learned a whole new way of thinking about what the problem was, the change problem, the leadership problem, and they started taking new and I can remember talking about more leadership for more people that kind of mobilizes the troops to do great things. Yeah. I visited their headquarters once and I can still remember being picked up at the hotel with a couple of my colleagues mm -hmm. going over there, getting out of the, uh, of, of the car at their corporate headquarters. And there was a group of 20 or 30 of their employees out front with signs. <laughs> saying welcome and cheering. And yeah. Of course, I'm wondering who's coming. Uh, you know. <laughs> You're looking behind you. Is there another car? <laughs> right. And then finally, it's dawning in, 
dawning on me that, no, this is for us. And we go inside and the lobby has two levels, a mezzanine level and a regular. And there must have been 75 people in that lobby. Again, cheering with signs, et cetera, all well. And it was their way, I think, of signaling to us, we, we've got it. We really have picked up this. We can mobilize large numbers of people in our firm in a common cause, mission driven, to achieve this uh, uh, strategic opportunity that we've seen for years now and not been able to. Uh, and they, over a two year period, uh, changed the way they operated, learned enormously. The CEO did a fantastic job and um, their stock price, I'm sure it at least doubled. Mm -hmm. The revenues went up uh, unprecedented amount. And just as importantly, what they were able to offer their clientele, their customers, yeah. Uh, it just became better and better and better, making a, a big difference in a lot of people's lives. Great fun. Um, and that's what I love. In terms of a uh, great story, um, in terms of uh, like types of companies you work with, um, are there certain industries or size of company or like give us a feel for like, because at the end of this, I'm, we're of course going to put, you know, the information for Cotter International and the show notes and all that good stuff. And I just want to make sure that the right types of individuals um, do connect and follow up. So who typically gets the most value out of working with you and your team? Um, if I were to say size is relevant, mm -hmm. um, um, people that are firms that are under, a, say, two or three hundred million, mm -hmm. um, we don't yet. We're going to in the mm -hmm. near term, but we don't yet have a good solution for that. Mm -hmm. And if they get to be huge, Doug, the guy that runs Walmart, who's an extraordinary uh, man, by the way. Uh, he, he's got, he's too big. <laughs> we, we, we couldn't begin to help him. So there's something around maybe 300 million to 30 billion. That's the size that we can deal with. Uh, and industries, we are dealing a lot with industries that have traditionally been uh, highly regulated or static for whatever reason, technology or mm -hmm. government regs, and, it's, and that now are being really buffeted by these global forces. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've dealt with high tech and low tech, uh, retail and B2B, uh, everything. As it turns out, and that's part of the point of this new book, mm -hmm. um, uh, human nature is human nature. Organizations are organizations and it applies across industries and across countries, uh, the basic ideas, at least. Yeah, it's great. So, John, um, I just have to say, first off, it's been great having you on the show to learn more about your background, to learn more, of course, about the book Change um, and Cotter International. I just I just have to ask a lot, lot going on with you. I mean, what's next? I mean, what's next for you? The book promo, Cotter International. Uh, what's next? Well, one big thing that's next for us is the horrid uh, COVID plague that has uh, been hanging over us for a few years has um, zoomified, if you will, the world. Mm -hmm. And that offers an opportunity for us to do something that we haven't been able to do before. It offers an opportunity for us to package um, educational um, offerings that can be offered across virtual environments like this, where people don't have to get on planes and come to Boston yeah. and with all of the expense and the un inconvenience of that. Yeah. They can do it from their office or their home and learn a great deal about the science of change and about leadership yeah. today that's needed from not just their boss's boss, but yeah. from them. And we're in the process of uh, building out that business right now. So that's going to be very exciting. One thing that I'm particularly interested in also is the application of this work 
to how we lead our lives. I've got a draft of a book called The Life You Lead, and it's playing off of, uh, it's a play on words because most people don't lead their lives. Mm -hmm. They cope with the reality. They accept uh, what's given to them. At mm -hmm. best, they manage their affairs well, all of which is different from leadership. Mm -hmm. And I walk through that, and one of the chapters in that book is on finding your right mission. Mm. That's great. I uh, I'm in for that. You know, you already know the name of our platform and what we do. So I'm in. You're speaking my language here, John. But you've been speaking <laughs> my language here all day. I mean, it's really just been really a pleasure to get to know you and your work um, and to just continue building and to continue to follow Cotter International in general and to see what your team's doing and their work. I know I know they put in a, a lot of work on, on the book as well and bringing together the data and all that good stuff for, for the book change. So um, big shout out to the team out there that's uh, doing what they do at Cotter International. Thank you. So uh, if somebody wants to follow up uh, and, and connect with your team, I mean, what, what's the best way for them to do that? Just go, to, go into your browser and put in K-O-T-T-E-R. Ignore the pictures of John Travolta. <laughs> <laughs> if any come up and all the rest will be about me and the firm. It's very easy to get in touch with uh, us. And there's lots of free material on that. And on YouTube um, from people from not only our people, but other people uh, yeah. educating on what they've done, how they've used this, my work and how it's helped them. So just K-O-T-T-E-R YouTube or your browser and it'll be obvious where the company is and you can get a note directly to me through that. Wonderful. And uh, we'll, and we'll pull all the links and all that good stuff. So we'll have all that in the show notes so that my, my uh, audience can just head right on over and, and, and check you out. Um, and speaking of the audience, if this is your first time engaging with Mission Matters or the platform or listening to us or watching us, um, just to let you know, we're all about bringing on mission-based uh, business owners, entrepreneurs, executives, experts, really, and having them share their mission, why they do what they do, like what gets them fired up to go out there into the world and to make a difference. Um, if that's the type of content that you're into or if that sounds exciting to you, uh, we welcome you to hit that subscribe button because we have many more mission-based individuals coming up for you next and we don't want you to miss a thing and john um really it has been a pleasure thank you again for coming on the show thank you adam mm -hmm.